Hi everyone, welcome to a very special Bon Fête. Welcome to a very special uh, afternoon here on, uh, I guess, Quebec National Holiday. Saint Jean, Saint Jean Baptiste, La Fête Nationale. And uh, I thought this would be a perfect day to invite Noah Seidel to speak to me about Bill 21 and how it affects the Jewish community. So I wanted to ask you a few questions. People have been asking me about Bill 21 and there's all this stuff in the media. Obviously, it's very easy to kind of whitewash it. What is the story with Bill 21 well, and the Jewish community? So just, just some background for anybody who doesn't know me. I'm uh, an NDGer, born and raised. I'm Jewish. I'm part of the, uh, the shul here, so uh, I'm very familiar with our, our community, um, the Jewish community, the NDG, the, the NDG community at large. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, I ran for the CAQ as a candidate in 2014, so full disclosure, I've been very close to the party, which I think is important for people to know. Yes. Um, but which I've is, always... By the way, which is why I invited you. Right. Uh, but I've been arm's length on the subject of uh, official secularism, uh, or legislated secularism, I should say. Um, even when I was a candidate, I, was, I made it very clear to no less than Hans Willebo himself that as somebody who comes from my community, I'm not comfortable with the concept of legislating how somebody can practice their religion. However, and this is where I think the debate is lacking in the public sphere. I'm not comfortable with it, you may or may not be comfortable with it, but when you speak with a large majority of the Quebec population, it, it comes from, uh, and I'm trying not to paint with too broad of a, a stroke here, but it comes from a background where effectively the, the religious experience that the majority of Quebec had was commonly understood to be that of, of an oppressive experience. And when they came through the Quiet Revolution, now you're going back to the 60s, um, they relinquished that, they got away from that. And there's sort of a concept that is, um, my religion oppressed me, therefore yours must oppress you. And there's a fundamental lack of, of I don't want to say understanding, I, think, I feel like the word comprehension is probably more apt because it's not from ignorance, it's not from uh, bigotry, it's not from hatred, it's not, of course, there are people within all categories who, who, who do feel like that, but the, the majority of people, they don't hate Jews for wearing kippahs or Muslims for wearing hijabs or so on and so forth, but they don't understand. And when you speak with them, and, and you have to speak with, with a large amount of people to understand this. You have to read the French press, you have to speak with people, and by the way, there's plenty of people in the English community who feel the same way. But when you speak with people who feel that uh, this form of state secularism is important, there's a, there's a break in their almost ability to understand how, for example, a Muslim woman could choose to cover her own face. Now, I'm not Muslim. So I'm not, I, I try not to speak too much on how they, uh, right. the Muslim community uh, uh, practices their own religion, but I'm Jewish and I have a son. And should my son choose to wear a kippah when he gets older, there's consequences to this. He can't become a teacher, let's say, at this point. Well, he can become a teacher and there's a counter argument. The counter argument is nobody is saying you can't be a teacher. What they're saying is you can't teach in the public school system. Now. Part of the reason we're speaking is because you know we want to talk about what the implications are in the Jewish community. And in the Jewish community, the reality is most teachers who are going to be teaching in the Jewish system, or most religious Jewish teachers will be teaching in the Jewish school system, which is private. And there's no application of Bill 101 whatsoever to, Bill 101, I'm sorry, Bill 21 to private schools. So for example, Bialik, every teacher there can wear a kippah, can wear Whatever, there's no... It's just the public schools. It's system. only the public schools. So let's schools. back up. Can you just give us a little bit of a rundown of what Bill 21 really is and like what it actually, what what it is and what who it affects? So the sort of, you know, in a, in a, a summary, and uh, it's a fairly broad law, so it's hard to just list off everything off the top of my head. Right. But fundamentally, it comes down to this. Uh, police officers, prison guards, judges, school teachers in the public system, principals in the public system, um, public uh, uh, prosecutors, and few municipal, I believe, officials. This is where I sort of, you know, it, it developed over the course of the last few months, and a few municipal officials uh, aren't allowed to demonstrate any religious symbol, no matter what the religious, or wear any religious symbol, no matter what the religion is, while in the functions of their job. Okay. So that, that's the nuts and bolts of it. And, and the background behind it, just to give us a little bit of a context of how this happened and so where it comes in. If you circle back to, I believe it was 2008, 
Um, leading into 2008, there wasn't too much of a conversation about religious accommodation in Quebec. Of course, there were always some conversations, but what sort of set it off was back in, it was either late 07 or early 08, uh, there's a, a small town called Hayruville. And out of the blue, no one had ever, outside, I don't think anyone outside of Hayruville had ever heard of Hayruville. And, and you know, with love to Hayruville, it's not like they were exactly a well-known place. <laughs> I've never heard of Hayruville. It wasn't, wasn't <laughs> like it was you know, Montreal that passed it. Um, the mayor of Hayruville and the council of Hayruville passed a law effectively saying you can't stone anyone for adultery in a public square. Out of the blue. So that's what ignited the conversation, which was effectively their uh, preemptive uh, attack or whatever they wanted to call it on Sharia law. That's, that was the, the, basically how the conversation started. And from there it became a little less radical and a little more um, uh, practical. And it became the conversation about religious accommodations in Quebec society. Remember, this is a society that has rejected its own, the majority has rejected its own religion. And I'm not making a commentary on that. That's their choice, not my choice. Good, bad, or in between. And I can find you people to argue every angle of that. So, so just to put this into context, um, the reason why this is happening in Quebec is because there is this anti-religious slaver because they rejected their own religion. Like, can you explain I think this? Anti, how, and I'll circle back to how the how the yes, the space, please. You know, I think I think one of the flaws in the in the conversation, certainly in more the English community, um, is the basing it around the concept that it's anti something. Mm -hmm. Anti has a, a, when you say anti X or anti Y, there's a, an understanding that you're fighting against something. You don't believe in something. I'm anti X because of reason Y. Right. They've more rejected their own religion. And it's a different thing when you say to somebody, you know, I'm Jewish, I'm, I'm you know, sort of modern, you know, traditional. Right. Uh, uh, I have challenges within the religion and not, but I'm not anti anything. I just, there's challenges for me. And I believe that when they sort of, broad stroke rejected the, the way the church was uh, dominating Quebec society. And none of these things are secrets. I mean, everybody knows why the Quiet Revolution happened. Right. It, there became this, it wasn't a, uh, it's, it's hard to say, it's not a rejection so much as a break in, we've been held back, we need to be free, and this is the only way to do it. And now everyone needs to be free. Well, and now sort of that's what they're saying is everyone needs to be free. But getting back to how, um, and of course, I think it's important to recognize that some of the things I'm saying are assumptions, they're understandings. I'm certainly not a sociologist. I'm certainly not somebody who, I haven't written any books on this, but I live here. I've lived here my whole life and I'm very politically active. Um, I'm very active in the community. So I think the things that I'm saying will be um, commonly understood, but I certainly don't want to present myself as, you know, a, a, a Bouchard or a Taylor in the sense of I'm not a, you know, I don't work at a university. Well, just to understand, the reason why I asked you to come yeah. and not a Bouchard or a Taylor to come and talk, because I wanted a version of this that is based on someone who's lived here well, a life, who's a lay person's right. explanation. It's because I don't know if I could understand a Bouchard or a Taylor if they were sitting next so to So that's me. part of the problem. So what happened was, following Herouville, the liberal government at the time uh, engaged Gerard Bouchard and Charles Taylor, who are... Uh, I want to say sociologists, but I'm forgetting the term. Um, they worked at the uh, University of Montreal and McGill, I believe, and they toured the province. And they asked the people of Quebec, what do you think regarding religious accommodations? What are your opinions? How do you feel? Mm -hmm. and at the end of it, they give the government a report. And the, there was, of course, it's a huge report, but if you boil it down to the headlines, the headline of the report, the fundamental recommendation was uh, for people in positions of coercive authority to demonstrate visible religious neutrality. So what they recommended was police officers, judges, and prison guards should not be allowed to wear a kippah, wear a hijab, wear a cross, wear anything of the sort because of the perception of being influenced by their own religion. Which means that if I get stopped by a police officer with a hijab, I may think that it's a Muslim stopping me and not a police officer. That's basically... When you boil it down, that's the concept behind it. So, okay. interesting... Uh, I won't name names, but I had um, a, a really deep conversation when, when I was first getting involved in the CAQ back in 2012 with um, someone who is now prominently involved in the Liberal Party. Um, and she said to me, you're Jewish? And I said, yes. And she said, how would you feel getting stopped by a Muslim cop? And I said, it's a cop. I don't care if they're, I, I'm not gonna calculate if I'm speeding if I'm going, you know, this is Sherbrooke, I think it's a 40 zone. If I'm going 70 and a cop pulls me over, I'm wrong. It doesn't matter what the cop is wearing on his or her head. She said, I don't believe you. 
And I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't think you understand how you're going to react. And I said, so what you're telling me is you're putting me, you're, you're jumping into my shoes to tell me how I'm gonna react purely based on the fact that I'm Jewish and the cop could possibly be of another religion or in this particular example, specifically Muslim. And she's like, yes, you're wrong. You'll be offended. And I said to her, I, I think you're, you're going too far. You don't understand that I'm capable of making decisions and evaluations and assessments based on people, not on whether they're wearing a kippa or a hijab. She didn't understand. And that's didn't basically make sense the issue to her. That's, that's the issue. That's basically the core issue. That when you really boil it down, fundamentally, this is a person, this is a brilliant person, and one of many. So I'm giving you one example, and of course, when it's one example, you can find one example to explain any case in the world. Right. But I had that conversation with 50 or 60 different people at the beginning when I was getting involved with the party they fundamentally do not comprehend that you're wearing a keeper by choice. Well, because their religion was not offered to them by choice. As is my opinion. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm but it, it makes sense. a little bit. To me, it makes sense. If you, you can connect the dots, if you go down the line, because I don't believe at all, you know, one of the reasons I was happy to talk to you publicly and, you know, to have an audience is I have a very, very big problem with the narrative that says... Quebecers are racist and Quebecers are bigoted and we're the most racist province and all of these things. It's nonsense. Unfortunately, it's the easy narrative. It's right. very easy when you don't like an opinion to fall back to you're a racist, right. you're a bigot, uh, you're a, a supremacist of some kind or another, you're a bad person because we have differing views. But there are people like that. Well, of course there's people like that. But there, I got news for you and which probably isn't news for you. There's people like that in our own community. And there's people so, like that in other cities. There's people like that in every city, in every right. village, in every community, in every religion. You can't legislate for the extremes. You can't legislate for either the the you know the most. You can't legislate for the worst people of society in any group. So what's happening now, for example? But what is, about the seventy percent? Here, there was a seventy percent pass, right? It's it's uh, the numbers. Last time I checked for uh, approval of uh, Bill Twenty One are more in like the high 80s. So but that doesn't mean it's right or wrong or in between. You know, there's so a concept. So is that negligence? Is that uh, people being illiterate? People not? No. Is that people no. in northern Quebec that never saw a Jew or, or a Muslim and they're just like basing it on something they saw on TV? So of course there are some. Of course there are some. Of course there's somebody sitting somewhere who's never met somebody from a cultural or religious minority in their life who says, well, you can't do that because of course there is. But that's not who you legislate for. Right. That's the fictional base. That's the, well, these people are just doing this to, to appeal to their base, and they have no support on the island of Montreal, the cosmopolitan island of Montreal. It's not true. Right. So when you dig into polling numbers, the numbers of people, and I don't have all the numbers in front of me, of course, but the numbers of people in NDG, in the West End, in English Montreal, in Montreal as a whole, in the greater Montreal community, who are in favor of some form of Bill 21 or a variation of it, it's not a statistically insignificant number. But it's not just about numbers. This is where the problem lies. There's the narrative, the common narrative, in particular the English community of the West End of Montreal, the West Island and West End of Montreal, the Western side of Montreal, is all Quebec City does is appeal to the base. They don't have votes on the island of Montreal, therefore they don't care what we have to say, you know, and, and it's just a bunch of small town people passing their laws, which, which you know, will affect Montreal. It's not real. Because, for example, the Liberal Party, the Quebec Liberal Party, which theoretically you could argue is the party of the west side of Montreal for now, and has been, you know, historically, they're the ones that passed Bill 86. They're the ones that banished face coverings. What is Bill 86? Bill 86 effectively is you can't cover your face when giving or receiving a public service. So... That was against kneecaps, basically. It's not... So that's... Here's the problem. The, the leap from this law is about kneecaps to, you know, what do, we, what do we feel is the society we need, it's a very easy jump to make. It's very easy to say it's an anti-Muslim law. Well, but at the same time, if you take religion out of it and you say, should you be able to get your license picture like this, there's a conversation to be had. And I'm not giving that opinion yes or no. The thing what is, that saying else is does, it, does it apply to? But you... you I understand practically speaking how people will say these are all laws about, they're all anti-Muslim laws. I think there's some truth to it, 
I think there's also some truth to the fact that there's a fundamental belief, for example, in this particular case, that you need to give and receive a public service with your face shown because Western society believes in transparency. Is that because somebody's trying to get ahead of Sharia law? I strongly doubt it. But is you there could see it as a slippery, slippery slope, right? I don't believe in the slippery slope. I don't okay. believe in the slippery slope argument, and the reason I don't believe in the slippery slope argument is in the Canadian context, we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And although I acknowledge that Bill 21 used the notwithstanding clause to circumvent that, nothing is forever. The notwithstanding clause itself has a sunset built within it. What is a notwithstanding clause? So the notwithstanding clause is basically in the, the 1982 Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The, there's, a, there's formulas for passing laws, various laws in various contexts. Within that charter, there's a way of suspending the ability to challenge laws in the courts. So if it was a forever notwithstanding clause, I would have a huge problem with it, but it's a tool. So just like uh, uh, Robert Barassa, the liberal premier, used it to extend Bill 101 while the battle was being fought in the 80s, just like Doug Ford threatened to use it in Ontario recently about the Toronto City Council, François Legros decided to use it as a tool in the conversation about Bill 21. It doesn't mean they're trying to, it doesn't mean they're saying Bill 21 is unjust and here's how we're going to get around the, the lack of justice in it. What they're saying is they have a belief that this is an important law for society. And in order to, in their words, create social cohesion, they want to avoid it going to, through a battle, to a battle through the courts. It doesn't mean it's not going to get battled out in the courts. And I think it's very important that it goes through the courts. What it means is the, they passed the law in 2019. There's going to be an election in 2000, maximum 2022. 2019 plus five is 2024, means that even if the CAQ is reelected in 22, in 24, max, the notwithstanding clause will expire. And they'll either have to reapply it or modify the law or do something with it. Or if another government comes in, they can repeal it or change it. Right. Point is nothing is forever. Right. So I believe, and this is where I think we're, we're, where it's very important to have this conversation with the public, I don't support legislating how people can practice their religion. I don't believe that a judge wearing a hijab is any less valid than a judge wearing a cross or no cross or a kippah or not. To me, I believe in the, the, the rights and freedoms of people in Western society, people in Canada, people in Quebec, to express their religious freedom. That said, I understand that the grand vast majority of the province does not comprehend and is not able to uh, uh, understand why, for example, myself as a secular, effectively secular Jew, chose to wear a kippah during this interview with you now, which I did out of respect for my religion, respect for the fact that we're sitting in a, in a, in a shul, in a Jewish community center. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people how a police officer, uh, you know, in the RCMP and in other provinces, because this actually happens, would wear um, a turban, a Sikh police officer would wear a On their own free will of their own free will, right. and how that's protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It doesn't make sense. So where I've always stood is, from 2009 when Bouchard Taylor came out, through till 2019, instead of fighting about sovereignty, we've been fighting about secularism. Right. But you can't have one fight. When a government or, or the opposition is focused on one argument and one argument only, because that's effectively what's been happening, although, of course, they've been legislating other things at the same time. But when you're blinded by one argument, I believe it prevents you from governing adequately. And without getting into partisan politics, I was not comfortable with the previous government, forget the party, but the previous governments that we've had, because since the 1960s, we've been fighting one, 70s, we've been fighting one fight. So finally, the fight about yes or no it's never over, but it's sort of pushed aside. Now the fight has been about secularism. And we can't advance as a society. So I believe it was very important to pass a law. I don't agree with the law, but I believe it was important to pass this law. Had it go through the fights and challenges it's going to have. At the end of it, something of it will, some part of it will stand, some part of it will not. Such is the nature of Canadian society, such is the nature of our court system. Um, and then we can continue to progress forward as a society. And I think it's very important that while we're going through that process, you don't take the position that you're either a racist or you're an idiot. And too many people take that position. Too many people say, if you support Bill 101, you're a racist. I keep saying 101. If you support Bill 21, you're a racist. And too many people say, if you don't support Bill 21, you're blind. Well, 
there are a lot of people, especially in the Jewish community, who are saying that this bill is reminiscent of 1930s Germany. And I know that you're just like saying, Rabbi, please, Rabbi, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There is no evil in the history of society before, after, or ever, hopefully, God willing, will ever happen compared to the Nazis. No one is a Nazi. They're not Nazis, they're not fascists, they never have been, they never will be. Trivializing the Holocaust because of a law regarding official state secularism in Quebec is unspeakably, an unspeakably poor choice of words. It's, it's a tactic that has no business being in the public discourse. And I, I don't even engage in the, I realize you're not doing this, but I don't even engage in the conversation. You know Godwin's Law? Godwin's Law, which is effectively on the internet. Right. Every argument eventually ends up somebody gets called a Nazi. Right. They're not Nazis. They're they're not. You have to think of the, the 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 monstrosity of what the Nazis did. They put Jews and other and other religions. But we focus on Jews. They put us on cattle cars and sent us to concentration camps, gassed us and burned us alive. But it didn't start like that. It started just, with. But it started with Kristallnacht. It started with. You no, know, it started before that. It started. It started with, with Adolf Hitler writing a book that said, "I want to exterminate these people." Right. This is not starting with but extermination. But there are people who claim that had Hitler not gone after the Jews, he possibly could have taken over all of Europe. And here you have... That was his mandate. Here you have something as reminiscent of his goal from day one. Where here you have a guy like Legault who should be dealing with very important issues. Why in a marathon, two o'clock in the morning thing, does he have to deal with this when there are much more important issues in the there province aren't of much, Quebec? No. Because you're, what you're doing is you're saying one thing comes ahead of the other. So while I did make an argument earlier that the governments of the last few generations, or the last generation and a half, had a lack of focus because they've been distracted by major issues, right? specifically like SNSNL and now the issue of secularism, at the same time, although I'm not going to argue that our roads are well paved, they're paved. At the same time, we have a bus system. At the same time, we have a justice system. At the same time, governments can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can't say because this issue is not important to you that why are they doing this because it's unimportant and not focusing on something else because it is important because it's all we've been talking about. It's the, it's the front page news for well, 10 why? years. Why? Because it's fundamentally important to 90% of the population. Why? Well, so now we're circling back to my original point. That's what is, I want to understand. So my original point is I believe based on my experiences as a Quebecer, based on things I've seen and done, the people I've interacted with, that there's a fundamental lack of understanding that, that, that says the majority population of Quebec does not believe, or rather I should say believes, that their religion oppressed them, therefore our religion oppresses us. But we're not dealing with it. So why is it important for them to, do, to, to legislate and, and have the debates in the National Assembly and have these conversations? Because just because we don't think it's important doesn't mean it's not important. It is important, and it is the thing that's taking up the conversation. It's taking up all the air in the room. So when you walk into a room, just because you think an issue is trivial doesn't mean it is trivial. Especially when 90% of the population have it as the first thing they think of that the government should do. So, yes. I mean, here I am. I am a visible Jew with mm -hmm. a kippah and a beard, and I walk around NDG, which is an area that is not, let's say, you don't have too many people like me sure. that are walking around. So I, I see an interesting version. And I have seen, starting with the Charter of Values, that came out during the, you know, a number of years ago, and now uh, with this, I do see people who do have ill-meaning feelings come out of the closet and feel like they have a right now to say something to me where I didn't have that before. So, do you think that racism and bigotry and xenophobia existed before this conversation happened? I think in people's minds, and I think that in people's hearts sometimes, for whatever reason, but not as open and as easy so, as it is right now. So I do believe that people feel more empowered in the last 10 years or so in Western society as a whole to express their racist views. When you have the President of the United States standing up in front of the world and telling people you need to ban Muslims from their country, when you have the previous government of Canada trying to pass a law involving barbaric cultural hotlines specifically targeted at specific communities. When you have the PQ government trying to ban, what, see, what they did was, it was so nefarious how they approached it. Their approach was to banish what they, what they called uh, uh, 
ostentatious religious symbols. So the difference between an ostentatious religious symbol and any symbol is when you start getting into what is or isn't ostentatious, you start getting into the nitty gritty of, and they gave the example of, if you remember, it was, there was a hand in their picture and there was a little Jewish yes. star ring. Yes. Have you ever seen a Jewish star ring? No. No, it doesn't exist. But they said, well, this is okay because that, that, the charter of values under the PQ had a very specific goal, in my view. It was to target communities. When you get into the conversation of Bill, about Bill 21, by virtue of the fact that they've made it across the board, they're not targeting one community. But you don't think the PQ opened the door for Bill 21? No. The, 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 I mean, the actual door was open for Bill 21 when Bouchard and Taylor were sent around by the Quebec Liberals to have this conversation. Okay. The figurative door was open when they passed this, this ridiculous thing in Herouville in, in 2008 or whatever it was. Right. That's sort of what kicked off the debate. But it was the Quebec Liberals under Jean Charest that literally opened the door, hundreds of doors all over the province, and said, please come tell us what you think. So they engaged with the public and said, please come tell us what you think. The public told them what they think, and then they sat on it for however many years, and nothing happened, which led to where we are today. I was always of the opinion that had they passed Bouchard-Taylor right off the bat, without the notwithstanding clause tagged to it, we already would have gone through the courts, the issue would already be off the table, and we'd be on to the next subject. Instead, what they did was they kept the debate alive as long as they could in order to stake out the position of the defenders of minority right. rights, all the while, while being the party that passed Bill 86, the party that, as a majority government, voted with 100%, including NDG's own MNA, voted against Bonjour High, things like that. Right. So they, they did the Quebec liberal thing where they juggle, you know, we're going to stake out this position, but, you know, we're going to backdoor what we actually want to do and keep the debate alive as long as possible. It's in their interest, it's in the PQ's interest to keep that debate bubbling. What the government did now, and I'm not here to lobby for the government, but this is how I saw it playing out. What they came in and did was they said, this issue has been alive for too long. We can't progress forward as a society on this subject because all we're doing is debating it endlessly. That's right. What's the most logical, pragmatic way of trying to deal with the, with the issue of state secularism in the, the best way for Quebec society is to pass this law. Again, a law I don't support, but I support the concept of pass the law, challenge the law, fight it out in the courts, have protests in the streets. There's nothing wrong with protesting. That this is what our society does. We're supposed to have this conversation. This is democracy. This is democracy in action. It's right. a good thing. So my hope is at the conclusion of the cycle of the debate about Bill 21 that we end up either with nothing because it gets stricken down and or struck down rather and um, you know sort of goes by the wayside because the courts make the decisions or it gets peeled back down to the basics. And I think we can reach a consensus as a society that judges, police officers, and prison guards shouldn't demonstrate their religious beliefs while uh, influencing people. I wouldn't take that position, but I feel like that's probably where we'll land. Nevertheless, whether we land there or whether we stay exactly where we are, we can't keep ignoring it. But I wish the outer reflected the inner. The inner will still exist. Well, and of sometimes course. the inner exists more than the outer. Hang on. It's super naive right. to think that uh, a Jewish man who's a judge <laughs> takes off his kippah and all of a sudden the, the Jewish part of him disappears. Puts if you're, to pay. If you're Jewish or Catholic or, or whatever it is that you are and your religious, your fundamental re religious beliefs lead you to act in a certain way, you're not going to stop acting in a certain way, whether it's right or whether it's wrong or whether it's in between where most people live. You're not going to stop doing that because you took off your symbol. But there's an understanding in uh, our society that perception when it comes to coercive authority is also important. So there's ways of speaking and there's ways of dressing. You know, you don't go to court as a prosecutor in jeans because there's an understanding that in order to, to have a, a, a credible appearance, you need to be wearing a suit right. or business attire or whatever it is. If you follow the logic, the, the majority opinion is in order to be credible, you shouldn't also have a kippah or a hijab or a cross hanging off your neck. Right. But there, there seems to be a perception and a naivete all across the board. For example, all of a sudden, even in the American media, media Quebec has become the laughing stock once again. Quebec is not a laughing stock. Quebec is a, a society that made its own decisions that some people will agree with and some people won't. So it's very easy to cherry pick 
stories that back up the point of view that you think Quebec is either the worst place in the world or the best place in the world. I could find articles, I could cherry pick stories, I could, you know, I have a, a friend who likes to pick on the Prime Minister, and my friend will go and find the three clips where he said something silly and put them on a loop. Right. I also know people who do the same thing with Andrew Scheer. I know people who do the same thing, but it's, it's very easy to find the narrative. If you're looking, if your goal is, I already have decided what my conclusion is, now I'm gonna go find information to support that, we can find that for anything. If you look out on the more, the broader picture, sure, to some people maybe it's laughing stock, to others it's, a, it's a, 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 a society that took a positive step forward and is the first one to do it and everybody should follow suit. So there's more to the story, the story's far more balanced than gets presented in particular in our local media, which the, the narrative is very clear. Um, there's a much more nuanced approach when it comes to, for example, the Jewish community. Right. Most people that you'll speak to will tell you, I don't like it, but it doesn't really affect us because all our teachers are in private schools anyway, so. It affects, it, it affects, I think, six or seven people in the Jewish community. Which, to, me is, to me, is six or seven too many, to, That's be, right. to be truthful. I take that position. But the conversation has to be had. Just because someone else thinks it's silly or unimportant doesn't mean it shouldn't be had. The conversation needs to happen, is the point that I'm trying to get across. Right. And just because you feel like those six people should or shouldn't be teaching in schools doesn't mean you're either racist or ignorant. So if you had to create the narrative, if you had to write the story on Bill 21 that was an even keeled story that you felt really represented Bill 21, what would that story look like? I mean, I would start with, it'd be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. But the message I would want to get across fundamentally is whether you support it, whether you don't support it, whether you support some form of it or you don't support another form of it, whatever your opinion is, if you're coming from a position of, I want to have a conversation, and I would argue this with anything, if you're coming from a position of, I want to have a conversation, I want to see how you feel, I want to take the information that you give me, and I want to make decisions based off of that, I think that's the approach, instead of the knee-jerk, you're racist. Right. And so you find, and I find this often with a lot of these types of things, in general in the world, where people will just like talk at you, and they'll just swipe everything with a, you know, with a, this is what it is, instead of actually seeing what is it, and what does it really mean. And so here's another example of that, where it's so easy to look at the headline, Bill 21, anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish, anti-religious you know, religious minorities in Quebec, they don't want us here, this means, you know, somebody said to me yesterday, a Muslim man said to me yesterday, you know, Rabbi, what do you think they want, do they want us out of this province? Absolutely. And this is what people Absolutely kind of not. see the headlines and whitewash it with. Absolutely not. Quebec society as a whole is favorable to immigrants. What Quebec wants is people are going to be able to come here and integrate into society. So there's a next level conversation, perhaps for another video at another point. Right. There's a next level conversation about what's the difference between integration and assimilation. So the Jewish community in Montreal has been, in my opinion, massively successful over the last hundred plus years. I realize we go back farther than that, but effectively the last hundred plus years of integrating into Quebec society without losing our own culture and identity. It's right. something we're very strong at, it's something we do. The fact that we're sitting in a Jewish community center in the heart of NDG that is thankfully thriving and is very healthy and is growing shows you, but, it's, but, but, but a community center that also you know, participates in the, the larger community shows you how well the Jewish community has done at integrating into society without assimilating into the society, meaning losing our own identity. But I could tell you it does take effort. Of course it takes effort. It's not easy. Is anything in life that's worthwhile easy? No. No. But, but the fact is that you have to want to do it, and you have to want. do it. That's the key, is want. So it's one thing to sit on your perch and say, they don't want us here, and leave. Right. It's another thing to say, I'm not comfortable with the position I'm put in, and I want to engage in dialogue with the people who are already here, or the people who have been here. My family's been here for over 100 years. Do I have my challenges with Quebec society? Of course. Do I have my own challenges with Bill 101? Of course. Do Bill I have- Bill 101 is the French language. Is the language legislation. Yeah. So, you know, for example, my father's generation, who, who was my age now in the 70s, they felt attacked, a lot of them left. You know, everybody says Toronto's the greatest city Montreal ever built. 
<laughs> That's a whole conversation. There's more half snacks in Toronto than Toronto pants. Right. right, but there's a whole thing that happened in the 70s and 80s. There was a, there was a fight. There was a clash. Now, people of our age, so I grew up here, I'm born and raised on what's called a, a child of Bill 101. French is not only, uh, it's not only important to me, it's not only relevant to me, it's absolutely essential to me. It's essential that my children grow up with French as a natural part of their lives. I grew up, because I was raised by people who grew up during the fight, I grew up with French sort of as being, uh, uh, you know, if not a nuisance, it was a, a, a challenge for us to, to juggle in our lives in the West End of Montreal. They grew up, French was irrelevant. So you have a generation, you have generations of people who grew up with French being irrelevant, Bill 101 came, there was a fight, they raised people who sort of, some people, if you speak with people in our, our generation, some people have issues with it, some people don't. It's, it's, you know, now all of our children are going to French immersion schools, most right. of them. Uh, you know, the Jewish schools in this particular context speak beautiful French. Right. Uh, the, the children are learning beautiful French along with, of course, Hebrew and Yiddish and English and all of these things. But French has become a natural part of our, our lives because we found a way to integrate into the society without losing our own culture and who we are as people. So, so nobody is saying to anyone, we don't want you here. What we're saying is come and there's no but. So there's a big difference between come but and come and. What Quebec society is saying, excuse me, is come here and be part of who we are, but don't lose who you are. Well, that's an interesting thing because I see the difference between, let's say, coming from the States to here, where Montreal, I see it as a mosaic. Right where the United States is more of a melting pot. Melting pot. So, is this Quebec society going towards a little more of a melting pot, saying Absolutely. we want you to be more like us? I don't think one thing has anything to do with the other. But it does look like that. I don't think it does. Explain. Because they're not saying, come here and reject your religion. They're saying, come here and don't outwardly practice your religion while performing, performing certain duties in your job. But nobody has said, drive to work with your kippah on. Sorry, nobody has said, don't wear your kippah. What they've said is, come to work with your kippah on, take it off while you're in your professional duties, and then, by all means, put it back on afterwards. That's, there's a big difference between a melting and pot and a mosaic And you don't think there. that that is... You think it just stops there, that's it? I mean, you're, there's, there's many layers of the onion to peel back there. Okay. I believe, of course, there's certain people who say, you know, I'll really... I'm, I'm thinking of a particular person, again, uh, someone who's fairly prominent in the media, so I'm not going to mention his name, but he's a person who is a, just a, a, you know, I joke with him often, I say, nobody preaches like an atheist. I say that all the time. <laughs> this particular person that I'm thinking of, no matter what angle I present to him on how I can respect my own beliefs in God, and respect the fact that he doesn't believe in God, doesn't get it. He rejects every premise, every argument, the very premise of the existence of God is incomprehensible to him. Right. And this is a brilliant man who I've had many, many conversations on many different subjects with who uh, uh, doesn't push his uh, atheism in his professional life, but certainly does in his personal life. Um, I'm not going to tell him, he's not telling me reject my own religion. He's telling me, I don't understand, it doesn't make sense. How could you believe in this thing that doesn't exist? And I tell him, I do believe, and here's the reasons why. It just doesn't make sense to him. He's not a, a, a bigot or a xenophobe because of that. Ignorant. And he's not even way. ignorant. I wouldn't even go as far as calling ignorant. He has conviction. This particular person's conviction is God doesn't exist. And here's all the reasons why he says that. And, that, and I come back to him and I reason. say, but I come back to him and I say, I 100% believe that God does exist. And here's all the reasons why. Right. It's, it's a, you know, there's some arguments that can't be solved in a, in a, I mean, most arguments can't be solved in a Facebook post, <laughs> a, thread of, a thread of argument, right. you know, but this is the kind of conversation, look, you're a rabbi, right? How many people come to you and say, say, I'm not sure about situation X, Y, or Z, what do you think? And you present them. A, but I always, I always think of that. And it actually in Talmudic study, there's two different types of questions. There's a Kasha and a Shaila. A, a, a Shaila is an inquisitive question. Like I want to know rabbi, mm -hmm. what does this mean? A Kasha is a, a question you ask to prove somebody wrong. Right. So, and I, and I always ask the people that are coming to me, is it an inquisitive question or are you trying to prove a point? Right. So give me the point that you're trying to prove and let's work our way backwards. So this is the logic 
that we need to apply, in my opinion, to the conversation about Bill 21, about the position of religious minorities in Quebec, cultural minorities, and so on. If you're coming in with the point of Quebec doesn't want us and they're rejecting us, therefore, here's my question, there's no conversation to be had. Right. If the question is, like you're asking me, why do you think they feel like this? It doesn't mean you're gonna get the answer you want, but it means you're gonna have a conversation. And there's a difference between a conversation and imposing your beliefs on somebody. And in this particular case, I believe that in order to advance the debate, they needed to pass their law to advance the conversation. The conversation is gonna continue now, but it had to happen. Aside for protesting, which like you said, has sure. its own place. Do you think there is something else that we as a Jewish community can do sure. now to maybe educate or to, I don't, I don't know what that is, but what is the next step for us? Well, I mean, there's, there's politically speaking, you can engage with your MNA. So most MNAs in the, in the, that represent larger Jewish communities are gonna be liberals. So you're talking about Kathleen Weil, um, I'm forgetting his first name. David Kelly, Birnbaum. David Birnbaum, these people. Engage with them if you can. Um, you can also reach out to, for example, uh, the office of Simon Jean Barret, who's the minister responsible for uh, um, Bill 21. You could reach out from the English community, the office of Christopher Skeet, who's the MNA in charge of relations with the English community. Well, he's the parliamentary secretary who answers to François Legault, who has the, the dossier. But effectively, you right. reach out to, to Christopher Skeet's office. You can, you can ask questions, you can write a brief, can, you can give your opinion, you can ask for an audience. You know, they don't meet with everybody all the time because it would be impossible. Right. But if you, if you group people together to go have a conversation, they'll listen. Uh, that's the political element. The, the public element, I think, is what's most important is to engage in conversations with people that are about being inquisitive, not about imposing your own answer on them. So I think in kitchens and community centers and backyards and hockey rinks all over the province, we should be having discussions. Even if you're two people who don't support Bill 21, ask yourself, why do people support Bill 21? Right. Why do people support, like you said, more than 80%, that's a big number. It's, it's a massive number. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're right. You know, there's the concept of, you, you know, our rights and freedoms the, and the, the tyranny of the majority and all of that, but we're not at tyranny. We're not at the, I'm sorry, what I feel is the absurd notion of getting Nazis involved in the conversation. We're not dealing with a fascist government and making trains run on time. You have you can't trivialize the conversation by making it so extreme that it becomes unmanageable and effectively incomprehensible. What you have to do is you have to have a human conversation. You have to be able to sit with somebody one-on-one -on -one or in a small group of people and say, we clearly have, have different positions. What is your position and why? And you have to listen. You know the thing people do where they're showing you a YouTube video, right? Mm -hmm. I saw a cool video of cats doing something funny yeah. on YouTube. And while they're watching the YouTube video, all they're doing is thinking about, oh, I have an even better one for you. They're not watching. They're not active. It's, it's a, a silly example I like to use, but it's active listening, right? You and I are having a conversation. We're actively listening to each other. You're not preparing your next video. No. You're listening to me. And the question you're going to ask me is gonna be relevant to the last thing that I said or something that's relevant to the greater theme of the conversation. Right. That's a conversation. I'm listening to your question and I'm engaging with you and I'm not pushing an agenda. This is what we lack, generally speaking, as a society. If you're gonna come back and you're gonna say, you're a bunch of Nazis because you support Bill 21, there's no conversation to be had. And that's not a society I wanna live in. That's certainly not the society that I want my, or, or how I wanna teach my children to interact in society. It's not how I speak to people. It's not how I believe people should act. I think you should have conversations, uh, you know, be understanding of each other, understand there's gonna be opposing views in debates and conversations, be respectful of the other person, even if you disagree with them. And, you know, frankly, it's more than just about Bill 21. It's about anything. Wow. Thank you very much. I really, I think that you really encapsulated a lot of uh, what I didn't know. And I think a lot of people don't really know because we do. It's very easy to whitewash this and to look at the media headlines and say, you know, this is not good and we have to protest it and we have to be against it. And perhaps, the, like I said, we, we both agree that it's not a good bill for, for society. But then again, in my life, something I've always tried to do is try to understand someone else's opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're trying to do here a bit. I don't know if we've gotten into it enough 
as far as to really understand, like, why would an average Quebecer, I mean, we know an average Quebecer, but why would an intelligent, uh, uh, educated, um, uh, university educated Quebecer? On that subject, yeah. most people who are having this conversation are intelligent, are educated to some level. I think it's really, really important that we, we dispense with the, it's just a bunch of small town nobodies who don't know anything and are ignorant. Right. That's not real, because the quality of the education system in small towns is a lot better than people think. Right, and I think it's important. These are not people who are blind. Just because you live in a small town doesn't but mean you don't. A lot of them have never seen a Jew or a Muslim. I agree with you. I agree with you. But what I'm, what, what's important is to understand that this is not a conversation right. about Montreal versus the rest of this, the rest of society. Just like when you go to the states, the the easy conversation is well, all these backwards people in Iowa support the the president, but all the cosmopolitan cosmopolitan people are against. It's not. It's a, a massive. People have said that it's over, Montreal versus the. It's a massive the oversimplification because it's not. I have because heard that. You go, of course, you've heard it. But if you go into, if you dig into the numbers and have the conversations, you'll see there's support and there's people against it everywhere. Do you know what percentage of Montreal is against it? I don't know. For, for it, I don't have numbers in front of I'm, me. I'm assuming the eighty percent. Uh, it's probably very different. No, in, in you're, Montreal. You're, you're right. Let's not. Let's not. You know, leave leave out the truth. The truth is, the, the at least. A small majority, if not a larger majority, of Montrealers are either opposed to it or indifferent towards it, or not comfortable with it. But Montreal doesn't live in a vacuum. Montreal functions in a larger society. Also, when you speak of Montreal, we have a bit of an island mentality in the sense that we think of ourselves as this little. It is a bit of a bubble. This little bubble because we happen to be an island. Right. Montreal is not just saint de Bellevue to uh, Vieux de Clévy or whatever it is. Right. Montreal is also Laval, Montreal is also the North Shore, Montreal is also the South Shore, it's the greater Montreal area. And if you live in Longueuil or you live in Brossard or you live in Rosemere, you're still effectively part of Montreal. When you start getting into the greater Montreal area, the numbers start to change a little bit. That's interesting. And, and I think there's, listen, it's natural for sort of uh, urban people who, you know, we walked out on the street right now we probably listen I went to high school around the corner from here and I think we had something like 37 mother tongues in my school wow well of course that influences how I see the world and of course if I went to another school that only had one group of people who speak predominantly one language and look a certain way and I think you can see where I'm going yes that's going to give you a different world right. view so when you when you try to get out of the little bubble we live in and look at the bigger picture, yes, so the stats are gonna show that Montreal is less favorable to official secularism. Stats are gonna show that the uh, Régions uh, de Québec will be more favorable to it, but we live in the same province. We're the same people. We're, we live together, we have to work together, we have to develop the province together, we have to develop the country together. Just because you live in rural Alberta doesn't mean your opinions are any less valid than if you live in Toronto. But, and that's, it's, they'll be different, but right. that's what makes us who we are, getting back to the point of mosaic and melting pot. We're a mosaic of people. But you need to have the mosaic, which means you had 37 mother tongues. Right. If you have one or two mother tongues, that's not a mosaic. But it's, it's unfathomable that we wouldn't, because despite everything that's going on, foreign investment is up, people are coming from different places to live here, uh, you know, people are happy to be here. People always say there's challenges living here, but Montreal's the best place on earth to live. It absolutely is. We just have to understand that the rules of the game are always changing. You have to evolve and develop your opinions as you go, and you can't just stake out, you agree with me or you're racist. It doesn't right. work. I want to go talk about one other thing. Sure. The same night of this marathon, Bill 21, mm -hmm. there was another bill that was passed, Bill 68. Mm -hmm. And Bill 68 effectively suspended, actually removed 18,000 applications for immigration mm -hmm. from the Quebec selection. Mm -hmm. uh, majority of those people who were immigrating were working people. Right. Uh, and what they said was they want to relook at that and they want to look at that from a, a French language perspective and from what they call a Quebec values test. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what this larger Quebec values test is. It just so happens to be that my family uh, and I have been trying to immigrate. Uh, we've been on uh, workers visas, uh, being a rabbi, mm -hmm. for uh, many years. And we finally have been going through the process over the past four or five years to immigrate. We were very close to getting our Quebec selection right before this happened. And uh, six of the 18,000 that were dismissed were my mm -hmm. personal uh, um, uh, immigration files, mm -hmm. and we have to start all over again. Okay. Now, 
I consider myself somewhat, uh, I would hope, contributing to Quebec culture and society. I think that I've done my part as far as, you know, helping to build Quebec, helping to build the community, mm -hmm. getting involved in various elements of the community. Um, some people will say I got caught in the crossfire. But I think that when you talk about it, the reason why I wanted to bring it up, and yes, it applies to me, it's so funny how both of the bills have an effect on me sure. personally. But when, but what, what's interesting uh, to me is, is it possible that the two are connected and that this is also part of, and you say, oh, you know, Montreal, Quebec is this great place to live, but we're trying to select and decide who does, based on the secularism of Quebec, want to be here. And, and if that's the case, no, then they're going to well, look at me and they're going to no, say, this guy doesn't belong no, here. The immigration, people, the immigration from us has nothing to do with religion. Very much a lot of it is language, but it's not about religion. The conversation about official state secularism is compartmentalized from that of immigration. Because there's nothing in any immigration that I've ever seen in any sort of immigration reform that says we will select based on religious beliefs. When they start getting into the question of the French language test, and when they start getting into the question of the Quebec values test, none of it refers to religious beliefs. But what, is, what about, does that mean then? So, so let's look at one thing at a time. So okay. the first thing is, I think it's very unfortunate that you were looped up in this and that it's happened at all in terms of the files that were scrapped. I'm not well informed enough as to the, the mechanics of how or why they scrapped the applications that were existing. But where I am more familiar is why they decided to lower the general number of how many immigrants will come in for a period of time. So they've, they've been very clear that they've said it's not a forever, it's a for now. And when you look at the for now, it gets to the question of the application of French in that conversation. So it goes like this. A person, whoever it be, comes to Quebec as an immigrant with the intention of staying, but they can't speak French. They come because they have a job. So you come here to be a rabbi, you want to stay, you have, a, 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 you have the ability to set up a, a community center and a synagogue, you have a following, great. What if you couldn't? So in, your, in the application of your day-to-day -day business, you're able to function 99.5% in English, right? Yes. Okay, but you have to acknowledge that's an outlier. So whatever, whether it's your situation or someone else's situation, functioning in English primarily in your professional life is going to be an outlier anywhere in Quebec, even in the West End. What happened if, God forbid, of course, the synagogue failed and you didn't want to leave? Now, you need to get a job. How are you supposed to become employed in Quebec without French? Without being able to speak French. The bottom line is you can't. So, of course, when you're speaking about a rabbi, it's a bit of a different situation, but make yourself somebody who came to work for a manufacturing company. So you've come from whatever country to come work in Quebec, and you love it here, you don't speak a word of French, you've been able to secure a job in middle management at a company that deals exclusively with the United States. So in your role, you barely have to speak French. Right. It happens, it exists. Yeah. Okay, the company closes. Where do you go from there? This is why you have to get into something like a French language test in order to come, and nobody has said you need to be able to write a dissertation on Camus within three years of living here, otherwise we're gonna stick you on a boat and send you to the middle of nowhere. What they're saying is, we're gonna give you a period of time, which they've allotted three years, to take courses that we're going to give you in order that you have functional French to function in society. So, if you lose your middle management job at the company that happens to not have as much of a French language requirement, and you need to go to another company, that does have a French language requirement, you can function and stay employed. That's when you really boil it down to the nuts and bolts of why you need to have some sort of level of French to live in Quebec. It's not about uh, uh, social engineering, it's about practicality, because you need to be employable. And the reality is in a province of, I guess, about nine million people where uh, something like 8.8 .8 of them are first language French, the language of business in Quebec is French, those numbers are off, but they're approximate. The, the language of business is French. If you can't function in French, you can't survive here. So that's the question of French. When it comes to the question of values, we already have a values test. So there's a little bit of a smoke screen, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, sort of like they keep passing the same legislation about uh, equality of genders. 
every government passes some sort of new legislation acknowledging the equality of genders, it's entrenched. Of course we have uh, equality between the genders in Quebec, but every new government passes another because what they want to say is we're the party that said it. Okay, there's a little bit of politics involved in it. But at the end of the day, the concept of uh, equality between, between genders is entrenched in Quebec society. The concept of Quebec values, which is very somewhere between reasonable to nefarious because there's a whole world in there. What are Quebec values fundamentally? Are we believe in democracy? We believe in equality. We believe in, in giving people opportunities to, to, to live. What would appear on such a test? I don't know. Frankly, I don't think it's applicable. I don't think it's, it's uh, uh, you know, if somebody checks off the wrong box because they feel, I don't think the values test is applicable. But the language test, I understand it is completely applicable. I understand the language test. So I'm sorry, I didn't get to the last no, thing. When yes. it comes to the immigration numbers, it was the third piece of it. So the reason that they said they want to reduce the numbers temporarily is because you have, you have a system that's been bringing in immigrants for however many years, but we haven't been giving people the tools in order to, again, there's a difference between integration and assimilation. We haven't, excuse me, been giving people who are coming enough tools, enough people, enough tools to properly learn the language, learn how society functions in general, to be successful in that society. So we have among the lowest rates of retention of immigrants in the country. They land here, they do their time here, and they go elsewhere in the country. Right. Because we don't have the ability to retain them because we're not giving them the right training. So when you lower the number of entrants, and it's not dramatically, but you lower the number of, number of entrants, you give those who come better tools to integrate and stay, then you can kick it back up again and start allowing more people to come in. Everybody knows Quebec has a negative birth rate. Everybody knows we have record low unemployment, so there's a labor shortage. I mean, I, I run companies that it's tough to find people to work. So we, we search out people, and I can tell you the amount of immigrants or otherwise unqualified people who apply, it's, it's, it's the, the vast majority because people don't have training. So it comes down to training and resource management, but that's boring. What's not boring is these racists are lowering how many immigration, how many immigrants can come in because someone in Haruville said you can't throw stones. That's very, that's a fun conversation for people to have because it's exciting and it's good headline news. But when you boil it down to practicality, practicality says you need a functioning system. To have a system function, you need to have reasonable expectations. To set the reasonable ex expectations and set up the tools for that system to function, the number of people involved in the system needs to be manageable. I, I'm listening to you, and I'm worried. And I'll tell you what I'm worried about. And just hear me out for mm -hmm. a moment. I'm worried that I understand the French language thing, and I, and I agree with it I, I, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to be hard for me to do. And there's no other way for me to immigrate to Quebec under any program without having French language at this point. Right. There's no way for me to get around it, even as a rabbi. And why would you want to? And I understand. I actually like your, your, your take on it. My worry is that the same way that we're worried about the, uh, the, the, uh, the values, it's gonna be, sorry. The, the same way that we're worried about the values of various minorities, like mm -hmm. that police officer with the hijab, mm -hmm. or with a turban, or with a kippah, we're also, I'm worried that I'm gonna to get to some immigration office and I'm gonna have someone who is, let's say, a closet anti-Jew, sure. and I have to now have the exact opposite of that. I have the reverse issue, where it comes to this person is responsible for this decide whether working for the Quebec government in the same exact role of, of you know, a, a, a civil servant who I am gonna to have to rely on that they're not racist so in order to be able to get accepted Is into it not this. plausible that the same person or type of person could work for the government of Alberta or the government of Iowa or the government of California or the government of Ontario? But they don't, they didn't get the green line on Bill 21. Is it, no, is it not plausible that a racist or a bigot or a xenophobe could be treating a file in another jurisdiction? But they don't have, is it, hang on. Is they it, don't have Bill 21 plausible. that says we are a secular state. That doesn't, Look at this guy with the beard and the keyboard. That up. doesn't make them any less xenophobic. So if your fundamental belief is, I don't want Jews in my country, and you are a, an immigration officer in any other province or our province, yes, 
that's not going to change because of Bill 21 or not. I understand the challenge that the secularism bill presents to people in terms of the perception. This is why I feel like it's an important conversation that we have to have because we have to hash it out. But meanwhile, despite the fact that Bill 21 may have given some people who have bad views license to feel like they can use those views in, the, in, in their job, the debate itself gives people that license. The way those people were raised gives that people gives those people license. The, the, again, the President of the United States stands up in front of the country and says, any one of the many outlandish things he says gives people like they feel they have a license. We don't live in a vacuum. Okay. We don't live in a bubble. We live in a broader society. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, you, you can't you can't presume just like we can't presume that somebody who chooses to be outwardly observant of their religion, therefore everything they do is what you know comes through the prism or the spectrum of that religion. You can't presume that just because somebody lives in a society and has a job and that society happens to have a law of secularism, that it's gonna make them feel empowered to reject you based on your views. It's the same argument both ways. I understand, but I'm worried that we, we got rid of one argument and now we're opening up a new argument. But there's always gonna be an argument because we're not dealing with a mathematical equation, we're dealing with people. Right. And fundamentally, when you're dealing with people, you're going to have people challenges. Gotcha. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't legislate but when worst government, society. Well, but when government, dictates these kind of challenges. If it's between me and you, it's one thing. Right. It's a personal challenge. But when it becomes a communal or a province-based challenge, it's a little different. You'd have to agree with that. I don't believe that state secularism, even if I supported it, which I don't, but I don't believe a secularism law about how somebody uh, has an appearance in the position of a judge or a police officer automatically means that a, a racist immigration officer will reject somebody's file because they happen to be a certain religion or or color or whatever it is. I don't connect those dots. Got it. There's a lot of questions here. I know I've uh, I've, I've seen uh, people asking all these questions, and I think we're going to have to have another opportunity. I would love to. to, to I'd love to bring together. some other people in also. Yeah, I think, I think so. It's, it's a healthy I, conversation. I think it's really, really important. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to have the conversation, and I think that it's not just me and you. Many people need to have conversations like this. I think this is a good starting point for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know me to be a moderate person, and I think it's important to preach moderation. It's prop. It's important to teach moderation. Understanding that there are also extreme viewpoints on on all sides, and we need to try to work together as a society to move the conversation, the debate forward, while understanding that all along the way there's always going to be speed bumps. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, and uh, we'll find another opportunity to Good. continue this. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thanks, everybody.